who are calling the uh, July 20th Sustainability Commission uh, meeting to order. Um, first off, we welcome everybody. Um, we're all here on uh, go to meeting. And as far as all that, I don't know if we want to introduce, we'll go around and just everybody do an introduction. Um, start with uh, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Dunn. Heather. Heather Miller. Dave. David Ruggiero. Joe. I'm Joe Collins uh, with the Town of Norwood. I provide the Sustainability Commission with uh, staff support. Joe Shimada. And John. John Freya. Emily. Emily Shea. Um, Mark Ryan. Mark Ryan, Director of Public Works, Town Engineer. Keith Bergman. Hey, uh, Keith Bergman is just in the committee. Thanks. And uh, I'm Peter McFarland, the uh, chair. So <clears throat> tonight we have um, a guest, uh, Mark Ryan, who is the town engineer and director of uh, public works for the town. Um, Mark oversees the uh, water and sewer department also, which handles the three Townwide systems, uh, drinking water, residential and commercial flushable gray water waste and stormwater drainage. And seeing that we had the um, catastrophic uh, flooding on June 28th, uh, we thought it was appropriate to ask Mark to come in and talk a little bit about uh, the storm and the um, stormwater drainage system uh, for the town. So Mark, it's all yours. Mark, on my, uh, your mute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all, all, those great, all those good words went, went to, went to right? what did I say? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and the audience. Uh, yes, on June 28th, we did uh, receive a, a very intense, almost catastrophic, maybe catastrophic for some people, rain event. Uh, we literally saw nearly six inches of rain in less than 12 hours. Um, between four and four and a half inches of that uh, fell within 90 minutes, which is just something, I mean, my tenure at Norwood for 21 years and in my lifetime, lifelong resident, I, I've never seen anything quite like that, Mr. Chairman. Um, it just, the intensity was so great. It came down and there is no drain system uh, designed to handle that kind of intensity. Typically, uh, stormwater systems are designed, at least the street drain systems, handle a 10-year storm. It's a storm that has a 10% uh, chance of happening any given year. And that, uh, that design storm is 4.6 inches in 24 hours. And we got almost all of that within 90 minutes. So you could see where why you know, streets were flooded, why houses were inundated with, with water, where roadways literally looked like rivers. It was uh, absolutely uh, incredible intensity. Anywhere you drove in Norwood, you approached a low point in the road, you were driving through a, a small lake. Um, those drain systems, those catch basins, even if we doubled the capacity of the catch basins, it still wouldn't keep up with that type of intensity. So it it was uh, something that um, we have to think long and hard how we can you know, improve our drain system, but we're not going to be able to spend the, the, the kind of money to handle what we just experienced. Uh, it just economically wouldn't be feasible. But there are ways to improve it for lesser intense storms because it seems like at least in the last year, we've seen uh, a handful of these quick bursts that just overwhelm the system. So, so Mark, as, as far as um, the system goes, this 
we have two separate waste systems. I mean, this, the flush that comes out of a house goes a different system than where uh, the storm, <clears throat> storm drainage goes. Can you can explain a little bit about that as far as, you know, we're hooking up the WRA uh, system for sewer ridge, which goes, what, to Deer Island? Is that where it ends up eventually? That's correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we do have two systems. We have a storm drainage system where the water uh, is collected typically by a catch basin. That's the, 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 the 24 inch by 24 inch grates. Many times you'll see water goes in into a drain pipe and eventually discharges to a brook or stream. The sanitary sewer system, when we flush our toilets, go to a different pipeline system and carries that waste to uh, through the municipal sanitary sewer system down to a main trunk line that is near the airport that parallels 95 and heads its way to Deer Island in, in Boston Harbor, where it was treated and that treated water, which receives a, a very high level of, of treatment, is then eventually discharged nine miles out into uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean by a system of diffusers. Um, oh, sorry. Mark, uh, just one thing too. Uh, there was no, we didn't have any uh, water main break or anything like that. Basically all the water we saw come bubbling up was from the storm drains, is that correct? There was no, we didn't have any breaks uh, in the water system, right? No, no, we did not, Mr. Chairman. There was uh, some media reports that the flooding at Norwood Hospital was caused by a water main break. That that was not true, and I, I think it was quickly retracted. The hospital system, if you ever saw, well, I'm sure you've seen the, the area that was flooded is a below grade, almost like a garage under, and that elevation is below our storm drain system. So Mr. Chairman, when the pumps to force that water out failed, that water just eventually inundated Norwood Hospital at that location. And my understanding, a lot of the mechanical and electrical systems are uh, stationed there and they were basically put out of commission. And that's, that's why now we have a, a hospital that's closed. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, uh, I do. This is Brian down here, Mark. Um, thanks for coming, first of all, it, it helps. Um, you had said quickly, and I just noticed it, experiencing on our street, we're at a low point of the street that over the past year or two, there's been more of those bursts. Um, is that something that like you've seen a cycle or is it in, in like just in your time here, it, has it definitely been an increase than before you know what i'm saying so is it something like you've kind of seen before and it's gone away and now come back or is it just a steady increase in those bursts so it seems to be a uh they've reared its head again brian you know many of us remember june of 98 we had quite an intense rainfall event it was longer uh, duration but it was about almost the same volume almost six inches of water and we uh, we quickly did, well, not quickly, but we started a study called the Meadow, Meadow Brook Drainage Study. And there's an area that's, that drains to the Meadow Brook, which is almost a thousand acres, basically encompasses most of the densely developed area, Norwood Center, you know, starting in Norwood Center, quite a bit above it, probably up close to near the cemetery through Norwood Center eventually down through Lenox Street and all the side streets down there, Pleasant Street and Discharge at the Meadowbrook near Sunnyside. And in that study it had some recommendations. It was, it was quite costly. It was basically the study was done because the police and fire station flooded out. And a small amount of that work was done at the fire station and things seem to work. And I think we all kind of get uh, comfortable that, okay, the police and fire station, which the flooding of it in 98 initiated the study is safe. 
I, I think we all kind of said, okay, everything's okay and things weren't too bad. But maybe a couple of years ago, Brian, uh, all of a sudden we get an intense storm and, and we've had, I think, three of them within the last six months that we really start, we start thinking about what we can do to, to help out businesses and residents during that time. Some of it could be low cost things instead of a set of two catch basins at a low point, we, we double them up to get, you know, you want to get that water in the pipe as fast as you can. And uh, those are the simple fixes. And then there's going to be some larger ones. The, some of the things in the Meadowbrook drainage study will come back to the table in the capital outlay plan, I think, to start uh, upgrading the system so it can handle that water coming down from the center and then really uh, west of the center to the Meadowbrook. We, we've got to start looking at, you know, investing in that system to, to try to help it along a lot better. So the answer to your question, lately we've seen quite a bit of them and um, I, I, who knows what's gonna come in the future, but we've seen the damage it can do. Any other questions? Yeah, so Mark, thank you so much for coming. This is definitely really helpful. Um, thinking about, you know, it, how costly it would be to the town to retrofit our stormwater systems in order to handle these larger storms that we're seeing. Is there any effort to encourage private property owners to handle more stormwater on their own property before it leaves their property and then becomes an issue for the town to handle and fl causes flooding issues elsewhere? Yeah, so the answer to that is any any new developed property, we, we try to get them to manage it more on site before it enters our drain system. Uh, it could be a detention basin is constructed and you'll see most subdivisions, residential subdivisions have that. A lot of the commercial type businesses or, or developments will have underground systems because land is such a premium for them to put parking. We haven't put underground systems in. And new houses typically have uh, their downspouts tied to a subsurface drainage system. So we we have been doing that the town for quite a long time. That's normal for a lot of municipalities to have new development take care of that. A lot of the areas part of that Meadowbrook watershed I talked about was already developed, so they don't have those systems in place. But anytime a new development comes in front of the town, even if it's a, if it's a, uh, a retrofit, we try to get an improvement in the drainage layout so we can help manage what goes into our system. And, and one of the other things the town, I mean, you know, you've got uh, back in the 70s, some of the residential subdivisions, and you'll know the Albemarle and Yarmouth Road and Harrow Road. I mean, the 35, uh, 34 foot paved width, which is quite large. Today's standards, we, we typically are looking at for a residential subdivision of 26 foot width, try to reduce the impervious pavement. And we, we, we do try to make an effort. Everything comes in front of us and, and you know, but when you have a storm like on June 28th, um, you know, it's really hard for the system, no matter how much we've done to, to keep up with it. Anybody next? Hey, Mark. Um, I am going to, the, the commission's writing a sustainability action plan, and I'm going to recommend to them that they include a goal that the town adopt a stormwater fee. Uh, could you explain a little bit about you know, what that would entail for residential, for residents as well as business owners and you know, what we could accomplish with that tax? So the, the stormwater fee that Joe's talking about, uh, a lot of municipalities are going towards that to, because it, it's really not a big push to upgrade drainage systems in, in municipalities. You know, obviously the focus is providing good services and in your schools and clean water and, and public health as far as the sewer system but drainage seems to be the uh 
you know, the one that doesn't really get paid a lot of attention, our drainage budget, just just for operation is a little between 40 and 50,000. So the stormwater fee would allow municipalities to apply a fee to a piece of property. And a lot of it depends on the impervious area on there. So if you have a large paved area, you're gonna pay a, a larger fee, a smaller house, Houses might be just a flat fee based on single family, flat fee for a multifamily. But those funds would go into to a, uh, an account that would be used to help uh, pay for these upgrades that we're talking about, these larger upgrades. So it's something that is, I, I understand is talked about. It's probably time we talk more about it because you know the events that we're seeing and it just seems like a fair way to, to spread the costs around. And with that, so I've seen in other communities where they've done that, there are also incentives for people to install like green infrastructure measures on their property, like green gardens or bioswales or something to try to keep that local. Um, would that be? part of what might be considered in a stormwater fee? Some kind of credit system or something for people who are managing their own stormwater, essentially? I mean, I'll, as far as, you know, I would think so, Heather, that could be built in. Joe, I'm, I'm sure is gonna be looking at stuff, you know, things like that, that, you know, the incentives people, you know, they might just have a one car driveway or, or, or or single width driveway, and they don't feel they should be a fee attached like someone who has a two car driveway or, or a larger house. So I, I, I'm sure there's going to be, I would think, to be fair, systems put in place to allow that. Yes. Keith, did you want to say something? A question. Uh, thank, thanks, Peter. And, um, First off, from Mark's benefit, uh, I'm Keith Bergman. I'm a retired uh, town manager. Uh, so, we asked to uh, assist the uh, sustainability uh, commission. And I have um, had some uh, experience with sustainability issues. I managed the town of Royalton, which, uh, which uh, have, uh, uh, have long ago adopted uh, a uh, low impact development. Um, best practice uh, for, for development and, and uh, by 2016, 2017, actually put it in the zoning bylaw and planning regulation uh, and it applied to the entire, the entire town. We also, as many other communities, had an MS4 permit, uh, which, uh, uh, so we did our plan, but we did not specifically have capital improvements the town was required to undertake in order to comply with the MS4 permit. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the situation is with Norwood, whether, there, whether with the MS4 permit there are capital, um, uh, uh, capital that the, the feds or the state's going to require. But even beyond that, because you had, I mean, and, and frankly, this is, you know, this is, uh, I think it, there's an opportunity, though, for Norwood, since you've had this catastrophic event uh, and you've got the attention of uh, the world, really, that if, if there were major capital projects that, that uh, you could undertake in the name of uh, alleviating the stormwater situation, and I don't know if the town is considering uh, submitting a master's grant application for anything else. There's a there's a case that's, uh, August 28th. Uh, it's millions of dollars. My, just my gut reaction is that because Norbert has the, has had this uh, very uh, uh, serious uh, incident, that there there would in fact be a unique opportunity to go to some significant state funding, not only through a mass works grant, but it might, it's the sort of thing that might even uh, uh, warrant, uh, you know, an earmark in a, in a major or a bill before the legislature. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, 
if you if, if the political side were was were to be counted that way, what what would it was are there things that um uh in either uh in plans, I don't want to say in the type of uh, but that, that are on the drawing board or, or a program where you could spend uh, uh, millions of dollars if they were um, if they were made available through the, uh, the a grant or the political process because you you got the attention uh, of uh, of the world I think now. Just <laughs> Unfortunately, that lottery was broken up. It sounded like we got the attention of you know, people out there. And are we looking into the political side of trying to get some earmarks and, and uh, any grant opportunities to uh, help with those areas? And, it, and the Meadowbrook is one of them, Keith, that uh, has substantial uh, work proposed right from the Meadowbrook right up to. Uh, Broadway near uh, East Cottage Street. You know, back in 2004, the, the whole project would have cost $5 million. So you're probably talking now at over 10, probably closer to 12 million. But, you know, if we take a little at a time and just have a plan, just like we have a capital plan for sewer and water, you know, do the same for the drains. Not, you know, take care of the Meadowbrook. Uh, there was in South Norway, there are issues, uh, absolutely, especially you near know, the bridge on, on Dean Street. You know, make an investment there. We, you know, I think we really become complacent with a drain system, but it's time, and especially as Keith said, you know, all our eyes are on us and everyone understands what happens when a storm like this comes. There's a, an opportunity here, and I think we got to do the political process and we have to look at the grant process and and we have to look at what Joe's talking about the the the, uh, the, the storm drainage fee absolutely I have a question cuz uh town meeting allocated a lot of you know capital money for the parking lots the town parking lots and happened to the Heritage Baptist Church because uh, they sustain, uh, sustained, uh, you know, I guess some estimates about three hundred thousand dollars worth of flood damage. Um, are we looking at doing some mitigating things to our parking lots as far as like adding swales or dry wells or something like that? Because uh, we haven't gone ahead with that project yet. Um, I thought it was supposed to. I don't know when it exactly was supposed to hit, but the money was allocated, I thought. Is there any status on that? And what's, is there anything that's gonna, for those parking lots, as far as uh, that goes? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So we, we do have a contract with Walsh Contracting, excellent contractor. They started work on the senior center last week. First, you know, they rip out all the pavement, they put new pavement back. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these places parking is a premium. We didn't do anything there. We started at Central and Day in the post office this week. Uh, Central and Day is is very uh, compact. So, the, and believe me, we look at each one to see if we can add some, some uh, landscaped areas and some trees and if we could, we're gonna do it. So Central and Day, we did not have that opportunity. Uh, post office, we did, we, we, we're gonna be widening the sidewalk there, put some trees in. I mean, that, that that's, you know, somewhat in a way a sustainable um, positive, but we don't have dry wells or anything going in there. Talbot parking lot or the Babel's parking lot with the Heritage Church abuts, we do have a, some um, a landscape island going in front of Babel's with a number of trees. Uh, but as far as any other uh, improvements, we did not, but we can certainly look at that because, you know, again, it's that type of event. I don't know what system could handle it, but 
even a lesser event can is there an, there's an opportunity now to make some improvements and we're, we're certainly going to look at that based on what the heritage church went through the, the other two parking lots are the town hall parking lots there's two of them really the one adjacent to the building had no real opportunity to make green space we tried to figure it out this parking spot next a lot next to Norwood printing would have loved to put a landscape dial in and trees it just it just didn't work out um, so we, we're trying it, it, you know we try to get, fit in as much as we can without losing spaces we should uh we will i promise you look at talbot see if we can add some increased capacity for the catch basins so any lesser events will be handled but that's where we're at uh, on those parking lots mark you mentioned that new development in particular is encouraged to deal with their stormwater on site but are there any requirements to do that i mean are there regulatory mechanisms in place to where the town can actually force um, new development or redevelopment to address these issues? Or is that an area where we should look at strengthening some of the requirements that we have currently in place? So the planning board on new development is is an easy one. And the answer to your question, yes, is, is enough in there to hold them um, you know, accountable to making improvements so they don't overwhelm our system. The redevelopment is kind of a gray area. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, the best you can do. Uh, strengthening in that might be a consideration, Heather, to look at that and really force it even more on them rather than, you know, you add, you know, if you add a so much more percentage increase, you gotta account for that percentage increase. Well what about the other 98 percent that already existed can you you know why can't we maybe not handle all of that but a greater percentage than just the the, the increase in impervious and you have so i think there's an opportunity there we could look closer at that absolutely for the redevelopment i think that'll go a long way and it's i mean it seems like there's not a ton of new development in norwood pretty built out so redevelopment probably is more common or as common yeah yeah I, I would agree with that it's it's more the redevelopment absolutely we're just you know we're redeveloping the where the uh, big y is former hannaford and you know not a lot i mean they made a, definitely a lot of improvements on the drainage system and but if you know we had something with you know more teeth in it we could have opportunity, especially being next to the Haas Brook, done more. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, John Apria here. Uh, I'll echo the thank you for uh, coming out tonight and speaking with the group. Uh, also, just a, a big thank you for uh, what you did and your team, the DPW, uh, during the event. Um, thank you very much. Uh, during the event and after, um, you mentioned the the Meadowbrook study. Um, also wondering, you mentioned a little bit about South Norwood. Just uh, curious about the damage that occurred down in South Norwood with the flooding. Um, also in regards to the the Neponset River and the Haas Brook um, running there. Um, you know, how flooded or overwhelmed did those areas, you know, South Nor, how overwhelmed did South Norwood get? What was the damage like? And then how um, swollen were those rivers down there? So as far as South Norwood, uh, as far as my understanding, you know, we had this one house really received so much water and they typically do in this and we've got to make it you know we made a little investment a few years ago we got to make a bigger investment to help them out it's dean street near the the railroad bridge there um, basically those low points you know fill up and the only way they go is downhill and if your your property's downhill it's going to end up there and, uh, we need to make some improvements there john on, on dean street at the railroad bridge absolutely 
other areas of self knowledge I I don't recall a lot because you know what it, it was the intensity was so short. You know, I'll give you an example. Hodge Brook. You know, whenever we have a, a, a long duration storm, would overwhelm the area down. Uh, you know, the Windsmith properties and and Davis Ave. It would. You know, the capacity of the Hodge Brook there couldn't handle it. It really didn't as far as we know, have a problem because it was a short duration, you know, the intense part was. So, um, and then as far as the parts of river, it, it did get close to flood stage, you know, not with airport, the town man, uh, airport manager, excuse me, monitors the, the levels of the Naponsa River because, you know, that could flood out the airport and has years ago, 2010 was the last one. Um, it ripped it reached flood stage and then immediately went down and that was you know because of the the duration if it was a longer one Hosbrook the Ponsa River would have overflowed but uh it really more was the drainage you know closed drain system just couldn't handle it and you know you had your low points in the road we have many houses that flooded out because you know these low points build up and then just cascade and go downhill and fill in people's basements and garages and, and it's it's pretty sad what a lot of these people had to go through thank you for that clarification yeah hi mark um i just have a quick question is there any uh, are there any towns and municipalities that have recently upgraded um their stormwater systems that we might be able to use as far as uh comparable data to what we have experienced to what you know our end goal might be just to you know i'm sure I obviously it's obviously needed but i'm just wondering if there's anything like a case study or uh i don't know just a another town that's kind of in our was in our position say five years ago mm -hmm. that we could look at and kind of use certain data points or metrics to include in our sustainability plan so as, as far as uh, development, Joe, is that what you're talking? Uh, like just, uh, you know, upgrading or redevelopment, um, anything like that to, you know, because you mentioned the stormwater fee and the reasons why we want the stormwater fee. Um, and I'm just, I guess, really just, you know, in a nutshell, like a success story of something that's happened in the past, you know, decade or so where a town had some sort of flooding and were able to upgrade their stormwater systems and have you know survive storms that either you know either other neighboring towns haven't been able to be as a uh, successful with you know th th that that's a great question i i would love to you know well look at some other municipalities what have they done um unique things i mean you know we, a lot of it's pretty standard but there might be some unique unique cases out there it could be how you know what we talked earlier you know, redevelop sites, how to manage it better there, what kind of laws were put in. You know, we designed for the 10 year storm. Should we start designing systems for the 25 year storm? Something that rather than 10% chance, you know, um, it's more intense, but, you know, 4% chance, you know, a 25 year storm, but it's a lot more volume and probably a longer intensity. Look at that. Um, absolutely. There's, there's, I call it R and D, Joe. Research and duplicate, you know, and, uh, and that and that's something, you know, we'll work with the planning board to to do that. Absolutely. Hey, Joe. Uh, Keith Bergman actually sent me um, a few resources later last late last week, so I will uh, I'll forward that to the whole commission momentarily. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Keith. You know, as as far as sharing a success story you, most of you know where the old colonial cafe is uh, the old fire station and they uh their back door is is basically in a bowl and like we talked about those low points they fill up on these intense storms so back in 2015 you know after many floods of that you know the bottom of the old colonial is you know, food storage some of the uh, larger event cooking areas, a lot of industrial equipment. And they kept, kept flooding out and 
we actually uh, put in a flood proof door and they're made specifically, you know, areas along river banks. And this door in 2015 was $10,000 just for, you know, mm. basically a pedestrian door, a person door. And that, uh, that worked terrifically. The, the water was 50 inches up on the door and, and they, they didn't get any water uh, through the door. So you know, that's one of the things we're looking now to do with the, behind the Civic. Because once again, the, sliv, the Civic behind is full. It flooded out because the drainage system downstream just couldn't handle more water coming in. So we're going to be looking at uh, uh, procuring a, a, a door for the back there. And, and it works. You know, I, the way we found it was, you know, we Google the submarine door. You know, you'll, you watch some movies where they close the hatches when a warship gets, or any ship gets inundated with water and you try to save the ship. Well, they have flood barrier doors that serve that purpose. So there was a success story there. And we're going to go that route again to save one of our other buildings. Okay. Is there any other questions for, for you that might go, uh, if not, there isn't any? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. It was very informative, and uh, we'll we'll be in we'll be in touch as far as absolutely. That goes. Thank thank you, everyone, thank for what you. you do, and we'll definitely be in touch. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Okay. Bye. See ya. So. We'll get on to our regular agenda. Um, as far as now, let's go to the uh, subcommittee reports. Um, first up is um, uh, education and outreach. And who wants, Brian, you're gonna take that one? Yeah, I can start. And then um, Emily and Joe, feel free to jump in if uh, I miss anything. So one of the things uh, before we get to the goals and um, standards and that thing that we talked about was uh, doing another video, um, one because uh, NCM had asked, had said that if we have other um, videos or other media that they would put it up, and we also wanted to coordinate so that we could officially launch the um, one new thing Norwood. We were going to do it on um, on Earth Day, but then with with COVID, with kind of that whole celebration got um, sidelined. So we were trying to think of a way we could do it. So we came up with a a quick script of just like now that everybody's at home, what are some things that you can do um, in these times to still be sustainable, even if it's uh, small things? And then with that, we would launch uh, that idea of um, one new thing, Norwood. And the last thing we talk about is you can compost because everybody's eating at home more. And uh, Joe Collins had been able to get from DPW them to donate composting bins. So every week we'll have a thing where um, where probably the most likes or the most shares or whatever of somebody's social media posts of them with the hashtag one new thing Norwood, they'll get a compost bin every, we'll give out one a week until, what do we have, Joe, eight of them, I think. So, um, is that right? Oh, um, so just to actually talked to Mark um, yesterday. I was, I was gonna ask him this evening about it, but I, I completely forgot. So we have four composters. Um, That's right. Uh, I'm sorry, four tumblers, and then he's looking at getting four more tabletop tumblers. So um, whenever we're ready to go with that video, we can start giving away uh, tumblers. Yeah, so excellent. So yeah, so we would do one a week. Uh, and the, the thing that we wanted to do, so one is to make sure everybody in this group was good with uh, with that. And after the meeting, I'll share around what the script is, and it'll just be like two or three minutes, but we want to make sure <laughs> That we coordinate it, that all of us obviously put it out there on all the social media, but then also we coordinate it with um, the different town groups that are interested because we've gotten, when we first started it, people were asking like, when does it officially start and how do we do it? So this will be kind of the official rollout. And ideally we'd like to get it done by next week. Um, some point that we had penciled in the 27th, so a week from today to give everybody kind of time to do it. But um, I'll again I'll send out the script for everybody so that you can see if it makes sense and if there's anything you want to add but it was just the real idea is to give people 
other all um, things they could do while being home that are still sustainable. Um, so that is kind of the the first piece that we worked on. So that'll be hopefully something we can get done in the next week and kind of coordinate and get out there. So it's it's going. Um, any questions about that? Or Joe or Emily want to add anything? No. Uh, the other thing that we talked about was um, just, and this may be more minutia for later on, but just about uh, how, like if we need a process to communicate. So obviously each of the subgroups are gonna have um, stuff that they want to communicate out there and to get out at certain times. And um, once we have the, the um, report written, that's gonna be something probably that comes up more often. So we just wanted to uh, put in people's minds, the back of people's minds, like just how is that gonna work? So that again, so that we don't have, um, so everybody knows what's going on, but then also that it's kind of a unified voice coming from the group. Um, again, I don't think that's something we have to worry about tonight, but just um, to think about how, like, does it go through the education subcommittee and outreach, or does each group kind of do their own, or is it a combination? Um, so just throwing that out there as well. And then do we, do you want an update on the, the goals and stuff? We've been working on those and are kind of finalizing all of that, which um, I know Emily took a, like, re- configured them so that I think we all are going to look through and edit and um, I think those are in a good place. Well, what I think once we get all these um, subcommittees got their goals and strategies, I think what we always do is have a, um, a um, sustainability action plan committee that have one representative from each subcommittee we kind of like shuffle the deck as far as getting all this stuff under one report. Um, so as far as that goes, uh, making sure we don't have redundancy, like, you know, everybody mentioned greenhouse gases in the airs or something like that. So we could kind of, you know, get it out. So it's, uh, you know, one flowing report. And uh, so I think that's what we probably need. You know, we get this, kind of like everything, all the goals and strategies and the narratives done by September. In September to October, we work on putting it all together. So um, I, I, I don't know if there's any, the room has, you know, October, November for a special town meeting, but, um, but it might be put off until well, late November because of waiting for the state to give us their final numbers as far as what we'll get for, you know, what, what the cuts will be or whatever that's going to be. Because I know we, we did the town budget. We had some things that were um, contingent, like 2.7 were held back until after December, beginning of December, in case we had to cut those things. So I think we're waiting to see what the state comes back with um, an adjusted budget, especially local aids and stuff like that. So I don't, I think definitely have to be prepared October, November, but I think it's probably just as a guest November because they want to wait till uh, um, they get the finals from the state that could all change real quick. So that's my thought on that. I don't know if anybody else has anything else they want to add to it. Okay. Um, Brian, anything else on yours or? Is that it for? Um, uh, I think that's it. Emily, Joe, didn't. I'm trying to think. I think that's all the main points, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you got everything, Brian. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, who, Brian, do you want to handle solid waste or? or we have. I'm, I'm not on that committee. I can. I can try if you want. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Heather, Heather, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the update on solid waste is um, we had actually at our last in-person meeting made really good progress on our goals and strategies. And I took a shot at starting to draft some narrative discussing those strategies, um, but everyone should take a look at it and feel free to 
add to it and edit um, and make sure that the goals and strategies are finalized as well. It's so a question, Heather, um, and maybe Peter too. So we were talking in the education on the formatting and how much of a narrative for each of the goals and strategies. Like, are you doing a paragraph for each? Or are you trying to incorporate it all into one, like two or all the strategy and goals into like two or three, or does it just depend on the subgroup? So the way that we've done it for solid waste and resilience is we have our goal or goals at the top, and then just kind of a bulleted list of strategies. And then the narrative, I think, would kind of provide some context, uh, maybe talk a little bit about what the town has done on this issue to date, and then um, where we want to go moving forward. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question, but the, the narrative would kind of discuss all of the different strategies in the context of the goals that we're trying to get to rather gotcha. than rather than like a description under gotcha. each specific strategy yeah so we had the same setup up top and then we were wondering if like each strategy gets its own separate section but i think i think we landed on basically what you're saying is like having the the narrative kind of work all the strategies in towards those goals so i think i think if we it'll be uniform that way i hope at least I, I think there's going to be a fair amount of overlap like some of the strategies will tie together and accomplish some similar things so it probably makes sense to discuss them together yeah that makes sense and this is all in the um the google share drive files that john had created if anyone wants to take a look yeah, I was just looking over what Heather had done and we haven't got to public health yet, but it's they both those two follow the same type of uh, goals, strategies, and we really haven't talked too much. We haven't put the narrative together for public health yet, but we're gonna do that. But that's kind of like the first two parts of the same, and we'll probably finish up with it, writing a narrative that's gonna be conclusive the same way as uh, solid waste was done. Uh, anybody else um, on? Make sure I got the right one. So, so solid waste. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just note that I um, I left a bunch of placeholders so that we could insert some of the most updated kind of facts and figures about the tonnage that we're disposing of, the cost, etc. Um, so I'm hoping, Joe, that you or maybe Mark Ryan or someone else can help us to fill that in if we just leave those placeholders for now. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing I was going to bring up, I know that after talking to Seagal, I think it was really, help I think it's going to be really helpful to the Sustainability Commission as well as some of the department heads who will be, um, who are really going to be charged with implementing a lot of these uh, goals and initiatives if you know, they take of a look at each chapter or section. Really, I think everyone could, I think all the department heads will be able to provide everybody with some really useful tips and also uh, an idea of, you know, what's gonna be possible in the next five years and um, what either we might wanna leave out or maybe just have an understanding that maybe this one goal might take a little longer than in five years. Yeah, that makes total sense. At what point should we plan to share those with the town staff? Um, I think at this point, with a, a either the draft deadline is still August what seventeenth. Yeah. So I think running the goals by all the applicable department heads doing that probably in the next couple of weeks would be advantageous. And once yeah, I mean, that, sorry about Brian. I was gonna say, I mean, with Sigal, that's we um we had sent her the goals and a little bit of the strategies and like her what she came back with was really helpful in kind of really um, rounding those out. So and that was we didn't have a narrative at all. We just had basic goals and um, she was able to inform us on like what she's already working on, kind of things that 
uh, she's hopeful, hopeful to happen, this type of thing. So yeah, I think any time now, since we all have those would be helpful. Okay, and Joe, you can help us to do that outreach to the appropriate people. Oh yeah, yeah, once, uh, once you think you have your list of goals ready, um, I will start looking at it and I will send that to the applicable department head or assistant or deputy in the department. Very good. Okay. Um, so that's energy. Who's uh... Uh, that would be uh, me, Peter, David. I'm on the phone. Uh, my neighborhood is in a blackout right now. I guess the transformer blew across the street. That's always an exciting thing. Um, so well, next to Meadowbrook. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm having fun. You're right at the middle. Okay. Gotcha. I am. Uh, there was someone kayaking by my house not a few weeks ago. Uh, so yeah, that definitely needs some um, some attention. Uh, with regards to energy, Mark and I met a few times over the last month, and um, you know he provided some much needed edits and direction to our plan our you know our goals and strategies uh and i'd say the document's about 85 90 percent complete at least you know for our our input i've been working with dan morrissey down at norwood light to pull together some uh information just to show the investments and the return that the town has had in in energy efficiency um from a municipal standpoint and then with Energy New England um, on the residential side. And we've also done some outreach to, to National Grid uh, with regards to you know gas programs for commercial and residential. So we're, we're happy with where we're at. We have some good numbers, some good arguments that say, yes, energy efficiency is important. Um, and you know, I, I think we would help to have you know the, the the main body of uh, the, the text reviewed, I guess, by the the committee to um, kind of streamline it and get it in line with everyone else. Uh, but we have a little bit more work. Um, John would love to have you take a look at it uh, if you have some time, just to get a third opinion in there. We're in good shape. Yeah, thank you, Dave. You and Mark did a great job on it so far, and um, I, I see, um, you know, we'll have no reason to have it finalized by the next meeting. Uh, no, yeah, that, that, that's the aim. Um, and just one last thing, the uh, DOER, Department of uh, Energy Resources, released about two weeks ago uh, a meta grant opportunity, which is municipal energy technical assistant grant. It's not just limited to energy at this point in time. Uh, and it does have some stormwater uh, management opportunities. Uh, so upwards to, I think, $12,000 for studies uh, to help towns either manage their energy or their water. Heather, I will share that with you uh we'll go head to head if you're interested because there are a few that i'm trying to get the town interested in uh to apply from an energy perspective but there is money out there um I've kind of tapped into that now so i'll let folks know if i see anything of interest so um there you go that's all i've got okay Public health. Oh, could I say one last thing, Peter? Hey. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, putting on another hat. Um, with regards to energy in the town, um, I've been touring all of the buildings and have taken a special interest in the high school um, you know, PV system, solar system. 
I don't know if any of you know that there is a system on the roof that it's been defunct for about 18 months. It was damaged during a windstorm. Uh, and I'm tr trying, I'm thinking, well, <laughs> we have 77 kilowatts on the roof. It does supply about 5% of the high school's electricity. It does make money and defer money. We need to get this up and running. Um, the facilities department has, has some budget, but not enough to put it back online. I am looking high and low for grant opportunities for anyone that may want to assist uh, through Department of Education, Department of Energy, both state and federal level. Uh, and someone suggested, well, you know, what about locally? What about benefactors that may want to help, you know, with high and the like? We are going to have an educational component to that. So if anyone has any ideas, shares anything about recommissioning or expanding solar, uh, we don't need a lot of money. Maybe anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars is the shortfall fall we're trying to make up. Uh, that's not a huge amount of money, but we'd really like to bring in uh, the community, bring in a bit more people. Dr. Crowley is real excited about getting some displays that kids loved for years, went away when the, the system went down, so they can actually see what's happening on the roof. Um, so that's that's a big, big part of um, what I've done the last few weeks. So if anyone hears of funding opportunity, uh, someone with a few extra thousand dollars that wants their name on the solar panel on the roof of Norwood High, uh, put them in touch with me, please. That's and interesting, that's Dave, on. that it's not, sorry, that, that's interesting that it hasn't been running for 18 months. Um, I guess just to piggyback on that, do you, do you know if there's an update on the solar panels in the landfill and should we work that into the action plan? Uh, I, I don't know the status. Joe Collins might know more than I do and I'm trying to grab some time with Tony and Paul Riccardi this week to discuss several energy initiatives in the town so i've got nothing on the landfill joe would you have any knowledge of that no i haven't heard anything new since probably the fall um i think that might be one of the projects that's uh, a victim of the covid19 response the massive amount of time that sucked away from everybody but yeah, but, I mean, it's better to put it in the action plan now and be able to take it out, let's say, a few months from now to find out we're you know, getting close to completing it, then you'll leave it entirely. Yeah, maybe we can work that in, Dave, over the next couple of weeks. The, uh, right. Uh, yeah, there's there's some mention of, of solar and renewables in the plan now. Uh, we can beef that up. And um, yeah, we'll see see what we can do. I would definitely work in the, the high school one to get it reactivated. The landfill. I I, yeah, always, I, I think you should be putting them in. Um, it, you know, if it doesn't get done this year, you know, nothing to say that it can't get done in a couple of years. I mean, not everything's going to get done in a year, but if we put it on uh, in the plan. And there's at least something to, you know, to push on as far as that goes. Joe Collins, um, does MAPC, do you deal with MAPC or is that planning department more uh, with uh, Patrick and uh, Paul that deal with MAPC? So they might have grants for this type of, you know, energy and all that, um, or at least know of them. <laughs> you want to take that? I can weigh in, Keith. I can weigh in on that. I'm still on the MAPC uh, executive committee as their uh, immediate past president, and there is technical assistance that's available on a rolling basis through um, through MAPC. I can send the link, um, and the the uh, and the. Uh, I, I think it would be some technical assistance money that you could go after. 
um, it, it might be in the tens of thousands, or in the 10, 20 uh, tops, but um, I think it would be available to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Dan, did you get that? Uh, it was broken up, so I'll listen to the recording. I'm on it. Yeah. Well, Joe, 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 I think got the, Joe Collins has got the, he, he'll, he'll, Keith will send it to Joe. Joe can forward it to you. Um, Great. As far as the, the link goes. So we're all, you know, you can look that up as far as that goes. There might be something there, especially when you're looking for five to 7,000. There might be something there that you can uh, uh, shake a tree and get something out of it. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, move on to uh, public health. Brian, do you want to take this one? <laughs> Did I have this I one right? <laughs> sure. Or we both can do it. Um, yeah, so kind of the same. We've, we've been working on the the um, goals and the strategies and haven't done the narrative, but we had an initial meeting with Seagal at the um, Norwood Health Department, and she was really, like I said, helpful in giving us a broader view of things that could be done. Um, and in her mind, that have now come to the forefront because of, um, because of COVID and kind of the infectious disease side of things. Uh, so we have another meeting with her a longer one this coming Thursday uh, with us just to, again, to talk through things, to kind of match up, to make sure that what we're putting in the report is also something that either she sees as important or we're not duplicating efforts. So I think I think it's it was really helpful and I imagine that Thursday will be even more so. Um, one thing I had a question, Peter, I don't know if it's for you or what other people think is, Mark and I were speaking afterwards about it. Um, and some of the stuff that she has in the goal just by the nature of it is longer than the five years you know that we're talking about it's like 10 15 even 20 years and some of it really isn't directly tied to sustainability um i mean some of it definitely is like reducing um emissions uh better like walking streets and things like that obviously but other parts really aren't um so i guess the question is one, do we include stuff in the report that is further out? Um, and two, if it's not, if it can't be directly tied to um, like climate change and sustainability, do we want it in the report or do we somehow delineate like this is stuff that can be directly, this is stuff that's more health department and good for the town? Um, or do we just throw it all in now and decide that later? I think we put it in and then we'll, uh, when we get together, to try to put the final report together as far as all that will um, decide, you know, I, I, is it more or less what topic it fits under or is it just the, the time frame that you're looking at? Is I think both it? questions kind of came up, like on the time frame, do we include stuff that is way down the road? Because I know you can, but we can start getting towards it. Um, and then the other question was stuff that isn't really affected by quote unquote sustainability, do we include that in our report? um when it falls under public health or or what and maybe it's just we put it there for now and then see what people think uh when the final report's done i, I think we put it in and weed it out if we have to as far as that goes uh, i don't think right now i think we're trying to make sure we ca capture as much as we can and we'll go back and look at um maybe um they'll say it's short term intermediate and long term and leave it at that I, I don't think we should overlook something like that because it, a lot of behavior has to change and it does get changed you know just because we say it should change in a year um and what that has to be sustainable too is it it becomes part of life not just uh bad to do for a certain time period but it's something we uh, change behavior and move along and becomes the uh, normal. It's my feeling about it. Yeah, I'm one of my guy. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think uh, Seagal will help us. I think Mark was excited about too, is that she was gonna help us with the metrics. 
uh, I think that was the thing that Mark was concerned about is how we measure this. And uh, Seagal said she would help us with that, uh, come back with some things that uh, they have already. And maybe that's something we can go with from there. So, so that'll be Thursday, what, 11.30 to 1. Right. Um, okay. Um, so it for as far as public health. Uh, so, uh, resiliency, who's got that one? I can do that one too. Um, so, I think we are in a good place with our goals and strategies on resilience. Um, started to draft the narrative, but I felt like it would be largely informed by our conversation with Mark Ryan tonight. Um, so I took a bunch of notes that I will add to that document. Um, but I think, you know, stormwater and flooding issues are, are really just going to be very, very high priorities for the resilience committee. Since we know that those are a big problem for the town and likely going to get worse, not better. Well, it's nothing like having a pandemic to kind of get you onto public health. Another night of a hundred year storm that kind of gets you the idea that we got to worry about storm drainage and, and other things that, you know, affect, we definitely have firsthand knowledge now of a lot of these things. So it definitely brings us, it brings it well into focus now. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you do anything, uh, storm water, have you looked up anything about as far as like best management practices? Because it has all the list of all those, you know, how to, you know, manage storm, you know, as far as uh, not just you know, like swales and dry wells and uh, all those things. Have you looked at, into that at all? And just as a list of things that are actionable strategies to help mitigate storm drainage? I haven't looked into it in the sense of what we already have in place, um, but that's why I was asking some questions about the current regulatory framework and where we can make improvements, um, because I think that is an area, if, whether we're talking about complying with the MS4 permit or you know, just dealing with stormwater management more broadly, um, those BMPs can actually be requirements and enforceable. Um, so it's a matter of how we get them to the regulation. Well, yeah, it's like the best, bylaws. best management practices probably fall more, more under the uh, planning department and zoning um, board of appeals too. Um, and also one thing we didn't talk about too is the conservation commission has a lot to do with, um, you know, anything to do with water that flows through the town um, in its natural source. I mean, the um, drinking water and stuff like that falls under the um, water and sewer department, but they have the regular, they're the regulatory body for anything that flows um, that could flow into a, a public stream uh, too. So we have, you have the, the DPW and Mark Ryan being the town engineer you have the planning department, you have the conservation commission. So there's a lot of this, not just, you know, I mean, those are um, probably the regulatory bodies and the enforcement issue too, is like when existing buildings is the uh, building inspector. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of people that are charged with this, you know, certain things and not everybody's, um, you know, in, Certain parts of it fall under certain diff different, you know, departments, as we just said. Uh, right. Yeah, I guess I kind of view this the sustainability plan as an opportunity to set out some comprehensive goals and strategies that then all of those various departments can work together on to the extent that makes sense or or work within their jurisdiction on these issues. Um, but I think definitely, Joe, that's, this is an area where it will be helpful to get input from all of those town departments. 
Okay. Ready. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to bring up while we're together? One happy screen. <laughs> I, I did put down as uh, August 17th for the next meeting. Is that workable? Yeah. Anybody, um, vacations or anything like that going to interfere with uh, attendance or anything? Sounds like it might. <laughs> no. All right. Um, you need a motion to adjourn? I'll take one. A second. Second. All in favor of adjourning and see you on August 17th. Say aye. 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 All righty. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you all.